Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session, which is with Dave Sidgrove Selick on all about building the firm of the future. Dave is someone who's doing some clearly different and uh, unique things, I think, in the accounting profession. So it's going to be a great, uh, great half an hour, 40 minutes or so learning about his journey, what he's doing, what his views are on the future of our great profession. So say hello if you're listening live on the Facebook group. And if you're listening on the podcast, hello to you. You can't engage, but um, thank you for being here. So without further ado, Dave, uh, how you doing? Hey. Yeah, I'm doing all right. I just said to you, I'm pretty, pretty tired. But I'm sure that goes for most accountants across the country if not the world so yeah that's my truth right now but lots of exciting stuff going on um yeah long-winded way to say i'm pretty good cool Fantastic. how are you doing man <laughs> yeah very well thank you very well indeed so give us a brief introduction about yourself then dave so kind of um how how did sid grove come about a little bit of uh, history on you and then um yeah how did sid grove come into being that i think a nice way to start yeah of course so some people might have heard this story already um, but I'll go sort of back to near the start, I guess. So I originally trained at PwC, like you, I think, Reza. Yeah, I, did. I, did. <laughs> uh, I was there for four years in banking in London, um, clients like the London Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange, Goldman, and really didn't like it. It wasn't really my thing, but it was a great place to, to train, obviously. Um, and I still advocate that for sure. Uh, yeah, I then moved on after four years and, and kind of didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and I think that goes probably a lot of accountants coming out of the big four. Um, went into a, an advertising company as a management accountant and then re for a year and enjoyed that, but still felt like mm, not sure. I then went into sales randomly in that company. That's a whole nother story, but eventually moved into the startup space. And for the next five years after that, um, I worked to various startups around six startups as a uh, number one in finance. And that's really where I felt that I became an accountant that I was comfortable with where I really felt like I was, I was bringing value and I, where I really started to enjoy the profession and saw how I could fit into it. Before that, I just felt like, oh God, okay, all I really want to do is DJ and you know, teach yoga or something like that. And then actually when I joined startups and was working face-to-face -face with founders, I was like, I get, I, I'm vibing off their passion and what they do. I can work with businesses that I believe in and buzz off being such an integral part of that. So that was that five years. And you might ask me like, why did you move on from there? Why didn't you just keep doing that and move up and do sort of CFO roles and stuff? Um, well, I disengaged almost every accountancy firm as, that I worked with when I was working internally in those businesses. And I got to the point where I was seeing stuff that I won't go into specifics, where I just felt like this has to change. And I felt like I was getting to the point where I was talking a lot about what I had to change and not actually doing anything about it because I couldn't from within these businesses. So I, I went, I went along to Zerocon 2018. At that point, I was still ahead of finance of a business that was a part owned by Bacardi and just thought, this is a super exciting area to, to start practicing. You know, we've all been talking about that, but it is, and it was just a sort of really pivotal moment for me to then go, I'm going to do that. And that was also at the same time when I discovered the, uh, stream deck device which we'll talk about i said i wanted to be all around stream deck but you know that's something that's that, that that kind of workflow not necessarily the stream deck per se was something that inspired me to realize hey you can change the way we do things this technology will enable us to deliver a completely different service to clients and the one that i had the vision to to provide so currently um, i've been running sig growth sort of full time for around just under two two years now I work with around lots of clients, but about 30 kind of regularly. And then I work with maybe around another 15 in different capacities. I also partner with a development agency who, who I work with to do financial models. They invest in, in sort of early startups and dev for them. So yeah, very varied, um, lots going on. I haven't scaled the practice yet, was looking to do so sort of around COVID. Really glad I didn't. Um, I just co-founded a tech company, which is inspired by the Stream Deck workflow. And that's kind of me, I think. Fantastic. That's uh, great. Thanks for that introduction. And uh, yeah, lo lots of areas where we can spin off. So what I think would be beneficial, and, I'm, and if you're watching and you've got a question, put it in the comments and I'll be happy to, to put it to Dave. So firstly, you know, you're obviously very much 
of you know doing things in a different way so talk to me about what is it that you think you do or you are doing differently what is your kind of your unique uh, value proposition what kind of clients are you working with and how are you yeah. using the tech that you have clearly you're still doing accounts and stuff so you're still using zero how are you then using zero and other things and obviously your favorite app of all excel i'm sure you know how are you using that to kind of package yeah. it up into this value proposition that makes you different from kind of you know most accountants yeah, well, I mean, just to say first off, like I found that really hard to understand. Okay, I've got the experience of being a head of finance. I know what I need to do for any specific company in this space because I've been doing it mm-hmm. and been providing value to founders. Doing that on scale, you know, as an external accountant working on a consultancy base is a whole different thing. Um, so what is my new, unique proposition? Well, lots of different things, but I think for me, it's effectively I wanted to take that head of finance service and give that to companies way earlier at the beginning of their transition uh, transit or their progression as a company their journey you know i was coming into startups maybe five years down the road turning over at least you know five million say and i just felt there was this massive area from like zero literally seed pre-seed to five mil and obviously above where they just we just didn't really have a service we did but not the service i was providing as a head of finance so my service really is virtual head of finance services and having that ability for those clients having an ability to literally tap into me whenever they want to. So I don't believe, and I'm sure there's lots of great accounts out there who have the same mindset in this approach of, you know, the once a year type thing, the transactional commoditized um, accounting approach. And even with digital firms and management accounts, you can still have that kind of commoditized transactional approach. Whereas for me, it's about building really good relationships with all my clients. I see them all. Obviously it's different because it's just me right now but I built something where they're all friends as well as clients. And I have a really close sort of empathetic, I'd like to think relationship with them. Um, like how, how do I kind of make sure that that's brought through into my values? Obviously I haven't scaled it yet, but you know, I also teach yoga, I DJ, and I've brought these influences into the accounting firm in terms of things I believe that do, should and, and do make me different, you know, and I want every accountancy firm to sort of take these inspirations, but, you know, being, more empathetic to clients, more compassionate, being more creative in the way that I design workflows. So yes, you talked about different app stacks. I think the key thing is for me quite early on in SIGGRAVE is I didn't, I stopped looking at what everyone else was using. And I went, this is as a client, you know, from the other side, this is what I needed. And this is what I saw founders needed. And SIGGRAVE and what I do is all about constantly going, right, how do I provide that? there i'm going to work this is what they need and i'm going to work back from that and just look at all the technology i could be using to to deliver that rather than going and i did start off doing this when i started the practice i realized i needed a scalable solution but rather than looking right what is everyone else using what are the apps they're all using and let's go with that i didn't start with I, i sort of quickly moved to they need this okay right let's move back and actually i started with the approach that i was taking within businesses that I was providing, you know, the way I was working with Excel within these businesses as a head of finance, and then went, how can I scale that? And then that's where the stream deck came in and became a product, an ecosystem that allowed me to take things that were taking me like nine days, let's say a financial model within a business, it, I could do them in half a day. And that kind of, you know, in combination with creating templates and assets within Excel using stream deck, um, and interfacing out into tons of different things it might just be something like initiating an an, an outlook template it might be using notion to manage the communication with clients so that they're not coming back and forth all the time we have a really efficient way to communicate you know different ways to take what i was delivering and and to make it scalable essentially and i'm still working on that Mm, fantastic no that's um yeah no it's it's great to hear i mean you know like you i've been a bit a big advocate over the last few years of uh, of providing this kind of full finance function from bookkeeper to CFO and anything yeah. in between for the businesses that, um, that, that really need it. And like you say, people don't really think or can't, you know, in their minds, they can't employ an FD until they get to a certain size, you know, million, two yeah. million plus is when they might, you know, just start to think about it. But, you know, it's crucial because most businesses, you know, fail within the first five years. So how can they tap into the expertise of someone at FD level, um, financial control level, but still have someone take care of their books in an efficient way for some, for, you know, something which is cost effective that they can afford. And that is the area that I believe, you know, we as accountants, we can fulfill that role with tech that we have these days 
we can do it much more efficiently than we ever have done before. And, you know, for the last 20, 30 years, accountants have got very complacent with this once a year recurring fee model, where as long as you don't make a complete pig's ear of it, the client will come knocking again. But times have changed and things have moved on. The clients are more demanding now as to what they yeah. want from their accountant because others are filling this space. And if we don't quickly move into this space, then somebody else will. Because this is the kind of stuff that we were trained to do. But then we, we leave it all on the shelf and we just do the commoditized accounts once a year. It's no good. We need to step up and do what we're trained to do and actually help these businesses with navigating the, you know, the complex world of finance and using our experience of working with different businesses to add value to their lives. So I'm totally with you on this, Dave. So now talking about some practicalities in terms of the how, right? So, you know, accountants are hearing this and saying, yeah, it all sounds great. And I would love to do this, but, you know, where do I start? I didn't really do it. I haven't really been a head of finance. I haven't been an FD. Where can I start to actually start, you know, practically use some of the tech that perhaps you're using? You know, how are you delivering this? Talk, talk to me about that. And hopefully that might help give people some, some tangible takeaways. Yeah, no, of course. And it's not easy, is it? Um, you know, and I, I totally get people like, yeah, it sounds great. I want to be able to do that, you know, but it's really, really hard. And maybe the I've tried the apps are not really working for me. So, um, yeah, it's tricky. I think, you know, you know, people are obviously councils are becoming increasingly curious to, I think, as you noted, like just there are players now in the market who are moving into this, this area of advisory and everyone's having to move with it. And that's great from a client's perspective. And that's what, you know, I, I'm really sort of key, keen to advocate. And what tech am I using? So yeah, I started off looking at some of the apps, so like the future ease, the spotlights, et cetera. And these are these are great bits of tech, but didn't fit my needs. And I felt like in order to get the ultimate level of bespoke kind of reporting to clients, there I moved to Excel quite quickly in my journey with Sigrove. And is something that I've been working with in terms of creating templates to deliver management accounts, financial modeling for of course as a head of finance but i then took that into obviously sigrove in the last two years i've been honing that as a scalable solution so in short and this isn't necessarily what people are going to want to hear um because obviously the way you phrase that is like what's the magic pill well, to a certain degree obviously i want to provide that you know what is the solution what are the answers and on this essentially podcast obviously it's a video as well but i can't tell everybody or show it can possibly take you through the whole ecosystem that i use and everything i use but in short I have developed, let's call it like a baseline Excel template that for various different clients, I have then bespoke for what their needs are. It might be they're looking at employee utilization. And so we're pulling information from their, their timekeeping software, and that's driving some graphics and stuff in Excel, or they might be using Shopify. And so I'm bringing some graphics in there, or this particular management might wanting to be looking at rather than an, a last 12 month analysis, they want to look at this year and then put in the projections or I don't know, look at things in different way, last year versus probably. So, you know, I'll bespoke the accounts, but there is a baseline template that I've created in Excel with the day to day fee, which some guys may have heard of. Um, I go on about this quite a lot on LinkedIn and various things that, you know, um, talks that I've done. But um, if you're not getting what you need from the apps in terms of delivering advisory and for a lot of people, and a lot of accountants, they are, then Excel is definitely something to look at. So that's kind of what I will say there in terms of Excel, as you might be able to tell with like the, the video and stuff, like I've invested a lot in how I communicate with clients. And this is something I'll be looking to scale with the practice, which is just stuff like doing video and the web calls that I have with them and having that something that's available for them to, to, to have more regularly. I find that it helps with the communication, the management information. It helps to stop kind of like essentially, you know, using things like loom lengthy meetings and questions from clients, which I know people are overrun with when they sort of do things like give them access to WhatsApp and Slack. So that's the communication aspect. I've gone really deep, really into that. Um, and then for me, again, I've talked about it a lot, but using, okay, I'll, I'll just touch on the basics, obviously, just so people can relate. Like I do use, I use Data Molino, I also use Receipt Bank. Um, I'm 100% zero. Um, what else tech in that kind of space do I use? Not too much else, to be honest. I don't use things like Xavier um and i don't currently for practice management at my size i just currently use notion so notion is a really really key tool for me um i'm sure there are probably quite a few people that are interested in it because it's got quite a lot of press recently if you watch any youtube you'll see them all harking on hopping on about it um it can do pretty much whatever you want to do and for sort of smaller practices i think that it's a it's it's almost something that could cover off all bases so i do client one pages on there i keep that whole world 
so they have access to that. It shows you what work I'm doing. I document within it. I provide the accounts feedback where I embed um, the accounts via ebook, the video feedback, the commentary, and they can ask questions. So that's a really great tool that's going to help to me as well. And then obviously, finally, and I might have missed out a few things. Sorry if I have. Um, you wouldn't know, would you, if I had? <laughs> exactly. um, sorry to myself if I have. I don't know. Um, looking back on this video. Yeah, so the last thing is obviously the street, the stream deck, the Elgato stream deck um, ecosystem. So I'll just move to that camera. So this is what's in front of me. People have seen this before. Um, if I can get my camera straight somehow. Sort of, there we go. So that's currently what sits in front of me. And those, I'll just come back here because I don't want to sort of like let that take over so much unless people want it to. Um, there's a whole, you know, I did a lot of, um, a lot, I did a few webinars around that and I've stopped talking about it. And that comes on to the next point, which is this has become so integral to the vision I have for Sigrove and quite frankly, how we do accounting in my opinion, because it's that transformational, you know, the stream deck and the, the, the workflow that it's enabled for me isn't like 10, 20% gains. I'm talking like hundred percent, 150%. And quite frankly, just. I wouldn't be doing this job if I didn't have this technology. Like I just couldn't handle it. I, I wouldn't be able to handle it. And I have so much admiration for accountants who are doing it without this because wow, like headspace in a bad place. Like it's, you know, we're juggling loads and loads of different things. Um, so yeah, I, I, the, the company we just co-founded after a lot of deliberating and a sort of year of, of looking at doing it is to take this technology into the professional space. We're currently working with the, manufacturers of Stream Deck and various other partners to to make that happen, um, fundraising the next month or so, and looking to work with some early adopters on the accounting side. Um, but it's not just solely exclusive to the accounting world, but it's something that I felt, not felt like I felt as an, yeah, I, I had to do because I sat here and I was like, I can't scale this practice if I don't work out how this technology is scalable. And as it is, it's not it's a gaming device that sits natively on your desktop. It's not a cloud-based solution. doesn't have centralized control. It's not out of the box. Anyone who's bought one, who's seen my stuff and is like, Dave looks amazing. What the hell? Like, it's just a blank canvas. It's going to take me ages to do this. And, 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 and you know, I'm, I apologize for those that have kind of had that experience. Like it's a, it's a lot of work. Yes. The workflow is amazing, but it needs to be out of the box for it. You know, something like a Xavier, you know, you log on, bang, you upload your clients and you've got immediate value. Right. And it needs to be that kind of experience. So, yeah. And also, obviously, you know, there's no coincidence that we're now looking at a workplace that's about to be overrun by Gen Z gamers, you know, people that are watching their, their favorite YouTubers using this kind of device every day. And what an amazing like workflow it would be for them and an attractive option it'd be for them um, whilst we're trying to attract the best talent into our practices. Absolutely. Upon your inspiration, I have one too. Yeah. There we go. I must say, you're right. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> you know what? The one thing that I use it for more than anything else, and it's just, it's a complete dream um, yeah. using it in this way. You know, the the snipping tool in Windows. Oh, right? yeah. Narrowly, you've got to press three keys to get to it. Now I've got just one button on my stream deck, and it is an absolute revelation. It's a god. Oh, it's amazing. Very so I mean, you could talk about snipping. I say, snipping tool. Every snip. God, that's going to amount to so many hours over my working life. I love it. <laughs> There's so much of that. that I mean, alone, just, it's definitely worth yeah, it. <laughs> 100%. You know, I've got it hooked up to people who want to use Snagit as well. So I use Snagit. That gives me, it's all about snipping now. Like for, for you know, because I do a lot of that with clients, right? Constantly yeah. doing little screenshots and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've got various different options here for different, this sounds ridiculous, but different snips. Like yeah. I have, you know, one that will give me a border with a shadow, one that won't give me a border, one which will give me a shadow, no border, and one which pans. I press it. And I can select an area and then I can scroll down and select a bigger area. And, and that's all of the push of a button. And that alone, as you say, mm -hmm. if you've got a workflow around, and I have a massive workflow around that because I'm constantly sharing. Uh, I am a big believer, and we might touch on it, but the, the, the client experience in the UI and UX and so important, it has to be beautiful. And that comes down to even things like emails, getting people to read your documents, getting people to read your accounts as an attached PDF. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like any friction point at all for me is something I look to override. And for me, I take screenshots of the accounts, put them into the email and then link to them. So I'm using the snipping tool all the time to take pictures of stuff that I then attach a link to so they can just press that in the face of the email. Um, and it's just little stuff like that that I experiment with and just kind of get feedback from clients as to how is that 
affect any experience for you? Do you like that? And then, you know, meanwhile, whilst I've got this COVID scenario and it's just me, um, yeah, by the way, this is ridiculous to set up, right? But it's all about me at the moment taking advantage of that. Meanwhile, my head's going, you need to scale, you need a bigger team, no one's going to take you seriously. But, you know, using this time to innovate, and I probably spend 50% of my day experimenting with workflows, building workflows, templates in Excel, mm -hmm. um, um, systems within, within uh, Notion, and doing all the things that I do not need to be doing as a single person in my firm, but with the view that I'm creating something that when I want to go with, with scalability, I'm ready to do that and to do it fast. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and that, that's awesome that you are, you know, clearly investing time and in working on your business in terms of setting up these systems so that when the time comes where you're ready to scale, to take on people, it's all there ready. You bring in the people who can run the systems to do everything as efficiently as you've set it up. So a couple of things you talked about, I mean, Notion, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm with you. I'm a big lover of Notion. Um, but I think it's really, it's a, it's a big game changer. I run my whole kind of coaching and mentoring business through it. I'm also working on building, because essentially you can, you can use it to create your own software. So I'm actually um, gonna, uh, launching kind of a business advisory type piece, so building it on Notion and hopefully then rolling it out to, um, to members of my program. So watch the space um, if you're on the program, but that it will be coming shortly because I think it's a, it's a great tool, like Dave said, in terms of the client experience, having them come onto something which looks nice, which is easy to navigate, which they want to, uh, you know, they want to engage with, they want to get value from. Yeah. It, it, it's, you know, gone are the days where kind of just a plain old Excel spreadsheet or an output from Iris or digital will do. Clients just aren't interested. It's just text. It's just numbers. We've got to bring it to life. We've got to think of new and novel ways of bringing numbers to life to actually, you know, to, to do that advisory role, to actually, you know, be the accountants that uh, our clients want us to be to help them in their journey. So I agree with you, I think... just, just, just going to jump in there really quickly. Such an overwhelmingly important part of what you just said is not necessarily, 100% is all about beautiful and creating good UI and UX experience for them and, you know, the clients to interact with and they want to be and want to work with. But people are overwhelmed with content and apps and software at the moment. They have enough to deal with in terms of their own app stack within their own business. Like for my mind, I, I mean, this is just my opinion. I don't want them logging into another futurely or another practice management tool or another collaboration tool or something that they don't know that's foreign to them. People now know Notion. Notion's becoming mainstream to the point where most of my clients say, oh, Dave, you are, either they've implemented it in their practice, in their company already, or they go, oh, I, on the back of you working with me in Notion, Dave, I've implemented it into my company because it's amazing. And pretty much all of my clients know Notion. They work with it anyway. It's the software that now is becoming universal. And so it doesn't have to be Notion per se. Um, it could be G Sheets or Excel. Companies know these, right? We start putting things into other foreign software that's specific to the accounting space. They're like, what the hell? And that is one of the key reasons as well why I, I did obviously content on it for Digital Accounts Magazine. I pulled things into PDF and then put it onto an ebook because that is a universal platform, the World Wide Web, that everyone has access and there's no barriers or friction to them accessing that content or them going and logging into another system. So minimizing the login, simplifying the workflow for clients is just as important as anything. Absolutely. Yeah, no, big believer in, in reducing friction to get people, what we, to get clients doing what we want them to do. So one thing that might be useful to talk about is pricing. Everybody loves to talk about pricing. So how do you go about yeah. pricing up your packages for this yeah. head of finance function that you are offering? Talk to me about that. Do you have individual client avatars depending on the, uh, the state or the stage of business life cycle that they're at? Do you base yeah. it on parameters like turnover or transactions? How do you price that up, particularly for startups, which can be challenging because yeah. they kind of need, need that high level input from you, even when they not, may not be uh, revenue generating yet. So talk to me about, a bit about that and, uh, and let's see where that conversation Yeah, as you, as you know, this isn't something I like to talk about that much, but it's becoming more relevant for me, but it is super important. I understand that. Um, and that's because my approach with SigWeb was always built upon build the product, build the service, and then that will take care of itself. Um, but I'm now at that point where it's like, okay, let's work out the price. But it, but no, really key things to bring up because it is still really hard and it's still something that I have to, 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 to address. So with startups, it is really hard. And I think that a lot of them find this very difficult when they go to accountants, um, even you know, from maybe the, the near to their seed stage, 
and they get a quote and they're like, that doesn't make any sense because that's quite a lot and I'm not doing a lot right now. So I agree with that as much as we need to quote for our value. Um, if they're at the beginning of their, um, of their business, their journey, we need, I feel we need to be empathetic to that. So I'll normally quote for like a first three months or a sort of pre-seed, if they're pre-seed, if they're not even really turning over revenue, I'll take that into consideration. Then in that quote, in that proposal, we'll also sign off on another price point later down the road. So there is built in, different from, from maybe businesses further along the progression, there is, you do take a bit of a hit, but you've got potentially, you know, a business that's gonna take off in the near future and there's huge, um, it just comes with the territory. If you want to take on the business in the start space and have all the kind of fun and, and, and kind of enjoyment of working with those businesses for me there is that element of what, having to price flexibly so i would do a more regular review than probably a lot of accountants will do i'll review even monthly quarterly and have to build be flexible with these clients hence why i work with them on a month to month basis um but i still have my kind of basic pricing levels so for a limited company i still start at like 150 pounds and then i kind of look at what okay what else do they need on top of that and that can be really flexible you know i think for me it's about um it's different because it's just me so i've been kind of looking at pricing in terms of making myself profitable and then right now i'm looking at obviously how do i scale that it just hasn't been my focus and which is why your content reser and you know a lot of the other guys in the industry is really interesting to me from that perspective um the key thing has been that clients love what they're getting from me and now I'm looking to go, right, how, is, how can that be scalably priced? I'm lucky because I do a lot of financial modeling stuff and that pays well. You know, I'll charge somewhere between around two to 3,000 for a financial model. Depends if they're, if they're a startup and I work with them, it, it could be less than that because there's an ongoing relationship. But I can do those pretty quickly because of the templates I've set up. So for me, it was all about, right, how can I very much your approach of like, okay, I know kind of what the price point is in the market. I know how much a head of finance is. If I can be delivering this, then I pretty much can charge anything I want beneath, let's call it, you know, a grand and a half a month, because I know that's the cost that it would cost them in the market outside of working with SIGGROWTH. And for me, the margin on anything below that, anything, you know, and above kind of 350 a month is, is, a, is, a huge, is a huge margin for me. So I haven't really been very specific there because it is different from client to client. Um, I'll be honest, it's something that I'm, I'm now addressing. So, you know, I, I do fine, um, you know, but um, in terms of scaling the approach now is the time to look at kind of how having delivered, having created this, this, this service provision around what I kind of called SIGRO 360, which is management information, the kind of ongoing support, and then interfacing into a financial model that updates every month as kind of like the premium service and then everything in between that. Um, it's, it's now addressing kind of scalable pricing, which I haven't had to. Absolutely. So far. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the answer is uh, that's, um, not something I have, you know, you listen to sort of guys like Joe David, who I have a close relationship and he has a very, you know, rigid pricing um, structure. And that's just not something that I have right now. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm all ears for, you know. What's your, what's your average <laughs> fee, Alistair's asking? Oh, hey, Alistair. <laughs> um, average fee is somewhere in the region of around £300 a month for ongoing clients. So it's not huge, but I've, I have a lot of financial modeling stuff. So um, that tends to kind of bring up my, my fees, but that wouldn't be right to kind of skew it, you know, yeah. skew the monthly fee with, with all that kind of work. Yeah. So yeah, I know the value is probably greater than that. Something I'm, I'm looking at. And, um, as I said, I didn't feel that the value was greater than that when I first started. I think that's the key point. You know, I was, I worked with clients in terms of building something and I felt like I wasn't necessarily delivering that kind of value, the value that I was confident in until I was confident with the value, AKA sort of recently, I haven't really felt comfortable with putting the pricing to where it is better represented in the market. So because I was going through this kind of process of innovating and creating all these Excel templates and management information and sort of tearing up the rule book, essentially, I, you know, I'm just being open and vulnerable now. Like I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy with the value I was offering because it wasn't complete in my mind, whether regardless of how everyone else might've seen it. Um, until I felt like I was really generating, giving clients exactly what they needed. I wasn't prepared to, to, to go out there and to, to move my pricing to, you know, where it should be comparable to the market for that, that, that service. And that's something that's happened recently. 
Um, I now have a really scalable approach to delivering to these businesses with strong assets, templates, and um, uh, you know, output around that. And um, yeah, you, you know, you asked me that question probably in about a month, two months from now, two months from now, there'll be a very different answer. <laughs> good, good. No, no, that's that. You know, it's it's always uh, an evolving thing when it comes to pricing and um clearly you've, you've, you've said that um, it's something that you are you are working on i think you're massively undervaluing yourself <laughs> i think you've got uh, so much to offer to uh, the likes of the startups and the, and the companies that you are working with uh, but you made some you made some really um apt points and uh, whether it kind of you've done it intentionally or not i think it, it you know it's in line with how we should be thinking about pricing moving away from the thinking that we should be making a profit on every transaction because we don't offer transactions we don't offer services we are offering a relationship so we should be pricing that relationship yeah in the in the thinking that we're not we don't just have this accountant for this month or this year uh, sorry, clients, we are looking at a lifetime value of clients. When you understand that, when you make that mindset shift from from actually saying, we don't need to make a, a profit on every single job that we do, every single conversation we have, every single email we send, we don't need to because we're looking at it, lifetime value, which could be five years, 10 years, 20 years. How much profit can we earn from this client in a 20-year period? Not for just through what they will do, how they will expand, the offshoots, but also through the referrals that we when we, we bring in. So there is a very valid point about looking at it in that way in terms of being empathetic to them at this point in life. And actually something to think about because we also have a kind of a virtual FD option, which we offer to uh, startups, to people who have got kind of seed funding. We've got three different options where they themselves identify to say, right, okay, we've got three options. We've got a, we've got a growth FD package. So, you know, if you're looking, if you are someone who is who is hungry about growing and you've got finance, and you want to move fast, this is the package for you. Then we have a reliance FD package. So they may have someone in a finance team and they want us to provide that oversight. And then we have a comfort FD, which is, you know, even, even less than that, where it's just kind of, um, you know, supporting them in whatever they wish to do, but they just want to, um, to, they may have got to a point where they are stagnant or they're stable and in maintenance mode. So by kind of identifying where they are and then within that, then they have complete peace of mind. They can use us as much as they want for as what they need at that point in time. We're not measuring time. We're measuring, right, okay, you guys, you need to raise money. We will give you the forecast that you need. You want, um, you know, you need this now in this time frame. You will get access to us for this monthly subscription that you are paying because it's right for you at this time. And that averages it out. So rather than thinking, right, I want to make a profit in the here and now in this month with this client, I'm looking to get long term. You know, these guys are going to grow and I'll give them the support that they need now based on where they are now, because I know it will, will repay over the long term. So some some perhaps people thought that, but, you know, clearly you're, you're on the right tracks in terms of being empathetic and, and hope. Hopefully, you'll find some models that will work for you. Oh, it's a tricky, yeah, it's a tricky one as well, Reza, because my why was always to help those businesses at the early <laughs> start of their journey, and that wasn't necessarily tech companies. For me, I do work with tech companies, but like real businesses, like real people doing, you know, not the kind of potentially overinflated kind of valued, valued kind of tech companies with VCs, and I do do that stuff, but. Yeah, it's, it's really tough because I was very passionate about providing this kind of service that I was providing to, you know, more established kind of startups to the early stage. And some of them just don't have the funds to to, you know, and, and, and to to pay for those services. And I think the one mindset is, well, if they don't have the funds to pay for it, then they can't pay for it. Whereas my mindset coming into it was, well, I'm going to provide it to them and then work back from there and make it affordable, make the margins. And then what happens then, though? is then you flip that and get to this stage and everyone's like, you're delivering like on another planet of value to these guys who you're charging the same as like what accounts are charging for yearly compliance. I'm like, I know, but it works for me in terms of bottom line. But then they go, well, but you could be charging like three times the amount. And I think that's where it's sort of conflicted my why and I'm having to meet halfway at the moment or rather, you know, almost I've, I've actually started talking to other accountants in terms of working with them and consulting with them because For me, it was, yeah, I don't know. I'm twisted in my why at the moment in that regard because I want these guys to have this service. I start paying my prices up. They can't have it. And all of a sudden, we're back to square one. Does that square one, is that a saying? 
It's a point yeah. one. Yeah, that's the saying, good, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's kind of where my mindset's been. So ironically, through wanting to deliver to these guys at that level, it's led to me like doing some insane innovation in workflow and quality of output. Then now it's like, mate, you're way over servicing. And actually, I don't think I'm over servicing. I just think I'm over, un, you know, potentially undercharging, well, say undercharging, but that's also like exactly what I set out to do. So it's, you know, it's, it's having a, it's, it's working out how that strategy moves forward. For me, you know, I set out to transform the way we deliver finance to early stage startups, founders, that has repercussions for the way we deliver to bigger businesses for sure. And so that's why I'm interested in talking to other accountancy firms about taking some of the work that I've been doing and helping them implement it into their practices. Um, and they can charge whatever they charge. That's fine. For me in Sigrove, it's about understanding how that goes forward, whether I work, whether I want to, 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 to scale something or I want to work with other accounts to do it or scale something commercial. And, you know, I've got to the point where the value I'm offering is it's now easy to easier to have those conversations around pricing. Um, and then on the side, do stuff where I offer discounted um, services to projects, businesses that I be really believe in. And then that's not actually within the sort of commercial strategy of the business. It's almost like charitable work to a certain degree, you know, certain extent. Mm. Um, but I thought it was just worth saying that because I'm slightly unique in that respect. Revenue and sales have never have never driven me so far. Like for me, it was all about transforming the way we deliver finance, delivering to these people, and working back from there. Awesome. No, that's um, yeah, that's, that's a great mindset. I mean, it's it's not a unique mindset that you want to deliver so much more value. I think a lot of mind, uh, a lot of accountants are in that mindset where they just want to help and they don't want to say no and they give clients what they need, but then they fall into the trap of overwhelm, of uh, over servicing and undercharging, and that brings its own problems. But you yeah. know, you, you've clearly got things to a level where everything is efficient and automated and you're delivering value. You just got to find that sweet spot between, right, I'm providing all this value. How do I ensure that it's not undervalued by my clients? Because you're getting, giving them so much and you're helping them to achieve lots of outcomes, which otherwise they perhaps wouldn't have. How are you, are you still able to kind of hold your value with clients and, and communicate the value of that offering? But, you know, it's been a great discussion, Dave. We've, we're already over time. So, Bringing it to an end, um, are there any questions? Uh, I think that's just a comment from Adam saying, as you're keeping the fees relatively low by comparison, could you reach an agreement to increase the fee going forward based on the level of growth as a percentage could be win-win for both you and the client? Something to perhaps uh, think about. <laughs> hundred percent. I mean, I, you know, yeah, thanks, Adam. Appreciate that. And I think, you know, hopefully a lot of people can, re re you know, kind of resonate with what I'm saying. I think that's why maybe it's an interesting conversation because, mm -hmm. you know, the service is like exactly where I want to be. Um, the pricing might not be, but that's for me. Yeah, it's an, it's, I think it's a relatively easy, easy conversation for me to have. And um, yeah, I will feedback on that at some point in the future but uh yeah it's been good to talk <laughs> awesome fantastic so just uh closing then where do you see let's say the next five years for you for the profession what kind of uh what uh because you're clearly someone who is very future focused so um yeah talk to me a bit about that before we close off yeah for sure um we obviously alluded to it earlier in the conversation but this whole kind of transactional commoditized um, compliance based accounting, I see that in various capacities, you know, technology, robotics, RPA, machine learning, et cetera, increasingly taking over from, from, from humans and therefore the value we have to evolve. We have to move into the advisory space. We've got to do that, you know, quickly. So I, I just, I see continued innovation technology. Obviously I'd love to get my technology into the market and show people how transformational that is. And therefore I see things like, and I go on about it all the time empathy and compassion towards clients to your client to clients being so so important this idea of the trusted you know kind of your trusted advisor being a really really key theme for the future i think you know the guys like alistair you know those guys i saw a question there out clip folio uh live dashboards and the accountant moving towards the you know that the typical internal finance department being a key theme as well so empathy compassion uh, a move towards the, the monotonous workflow being taken up by robotics and increasing move towards us, um, you know, interacting more commercially with kind of live dashboards. I think th these are all kind of key themes for me. 
that I see happening. And therefore, as a result of that, it's a different demographic of accountant that takes on that role for my mind. You know, I would think that the traditional accountant will start moving into roles like coding, whilst the kind of maybe traditional sort of consultants, potentially this world and more extrovert characters who want to get involved in business and, and, and work with people will actually move into accounting because they can see not only they're getting a view of businesses that nobody else gets, but they can still do the consulting role and pretty much be a kind of FD CFO from day one, which everyone wants to get to. But, don't, don't, you know, aren't prepared to put in the 10 years to get to that position, if you like. Mm, um, absolutely. And just finally, what one piece of gadgetry with uh, everything that you've got going on, either gadgetry or software tool, would you recommend to accountants to say, this is the one thing that has transformed your life the most out of everything else and is going to save you time? So you can, I know you've got so many to choose from, Dave, but I'm going, to, I'm going to try and get you to just pinpoint one thing. What one software or gadget would you recommend to accountants to go and buy now? <laughs> God, I mean, I, I won't talk about Stream Deck because I always go on about that, but I did do a post around my mouse recently. Mouse. And I just think that like you could map anything to these six buttons or nine buttons here and have, you know, your zero file, your your outlook, your, um, you know, your some Excel functions or futurely whatever at the tip of your finger. And, and for me, it was the gateway into a uh, massively improved workflow. So yeah, have a look at a mouse that has customizable buttons on it and uh, have a play it's really you might find it's quite transformational <laughs> love it love it i'm gonna go on amazon now and buy one i hope you uh, got some value out of that everybody uh from this session uh, dave's in the facebook group i think so if you've got any other questions and you're listening on replay then just put them in the comments and tag dave and i'm sure he'll be more than happy to to chip in and uh, help out and answer thank you everyone for joining today thank you very much dave really appreciate you taking the time out to join today and share your story and what you're doing with everyone so much appreciated take care everyone and i'll speak nice to one. You soon thanks guys